So today we're going to be talking about driving. And uh, for those of us who have been driving for a while, driving probably seems like a pretty easy task, pretty automatic. You don't have to get in the car and think about, now, which pedal do I push again for the gas and which one's the brake? And uh, how do I turn the car on again? I can't remember. Most of us don't do that. We just get in the car and drive. But what we don't think about is how complex the task of driving really is. If you think about all of your things you're doing at one time, it's a lot of stuff. So just think about something as simple as driving down the road and following a car in front of you. You're monitoring the speed of that vehicle. You're adjusting your speed accordingly. You're adjusting the pressure that you're putting on the gas or moving your foot from the gas to the brake. You're doing all of this simultaneously and without even really having to think about it. So driving is a pretty complex task. And that's not really even considering all the things that we do to make it even more challenging, like text and drive, which I'm sure none of you do, or talk on the phone and drive. Well, that's not even considering one of the most frustrating and challenging aspects of the driving environment. Everybody else, right? Everybody else is really what's making driving so difficult, right? Now, uh, when we think about driving, it's, you don't really think about it as a social task because you're in your own vehicle. You're kind of separated from everybody else by a little metal shell. You don't really have to talk to anyone. But driving is an extremely social task. We're constantly communicating with other drivers, anticipating their actions, reading their behavior, and trying to figure out what's going on. We may even use nonverbal gestures, such as this one, which I'm sure none of you have done, but you've definitely encountered if you've driven in 8 o'clock traffic or 5 o'clock traffic on the way home. So we use these nonverbal gestures to kind of communicate with other drivers. But we also use them to communicate with other types of road users, things like pedestrians or cyclists. So let's say we're approaching an intersection. We see this pedestrian here, this woman right here, about to step out on the intersection. So we have to take in some nonverbal cues from this environment as we approach it. So we see that she's distracted. She's not paying attention. She's looking down at her phone. So we have to understand that we haven't made eye contact with her. She may not see us. She might step out onto the roadway anyway, and we need to adjust our behavior accordingly. Maybe approach the intersection a little bit more cautiously. Now, one research study actually looked at this extremely subtle exchange between road users, and they found something pretty remarkable. They found that just the smile of a pedestrian can affect driver behavior. So drivers approached intersections of smiling pedestrians a little bit more cautiously and were a little more forgiving of those types of pedestrians as compared to those who were not. So there's this really subtle, almost instantaneous exchange that's going on between road users. Ooh, is that me? All right. Um, so typically developing drivers are pretty good at this. We can understand all these, take in all these nonverbal cues and kind of interact with them and react to them very quickly. But what about individuals who have impairments in nonverbal communication and social interaction, like individuals with autism spectrum disorders? Now, social interaction difficulties and nonverbal communication issues are one of the hallmark features of autism spectrum disorders. And it's more important now than ever that we, now than, now than ever, that we start to kind of interact with individuals with autism and figure out what challenges they may face just in everyday activities like driving, things that we take for granted. Because autism is increasing at a rate we've never seen before in the past decade. So this is, what, this is where our research comes in, because there's been no, almost no research looking at how the symptoms of autism may affect driving. So this is where we come in. Now, this is one of our driving simulators. And what we do in our lab is we research how people, people react to different driving situations. Now, driving simulators are unique in that they provide us a safe and ethical way to look at how people react in dangerous situations, things like encountering pedestrians that may step out in front of you. So what we did is that we had individuals with autism spectrum disorder, individuals with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and typically developing individuals come and drive in our simulator, and we expose them to these hazardous events. So things like pedestrians stepping out in front of them. And we term these social and non-social hazards. And these were defined as hazards that were largely visibly human in nature, so pedestrians and cyclists, those were our social hazards. And then non-social hazards, things like other cars or objects in the roadway. So we had them come and drive in our simulator. We exposed them to these hazards. And then our driving simulator automatically collected data on how they interacted with these types of hazards and how well they navigated around them. So I have some examples here for you guys, if the technology will cooperate. 
So here's an example of one of our social hazards. No problem. So you'll be looking at um, the driving simulation as participant would see it while they're driving through the simulator. And we instruct these participants just to drive as they normally would down the roadway as soon as they get in the simulator and we just let them go. It's okay, we can move past them, that's not a huge deal. So you get an idea of the center screen that they would see as they're driving down the simulator, and a pedestrian would walk out in front of them, or another car would pull out in front of them, and we gauge how they react to that situation. So I'll skip past these. And what we found was pretty interesting. So when we look across all of our participants, regardless of group, we see that our participants are driving a little bit more cautiously around our social hazards compared to our non-social hazards. So our pedestrians and cyclists as compared to our other cars. So we see faster reaction times, slower driving speeds, and in turn, fewer MVCs or motor vehicle collisions. Now this is promising as these types of hazards are usually a little bit more vulnerable than things like other cars. They don't have a big metal shell to protect them, so collisions with these types of hazards are more likely to result in fatalities or injuries. So this is good news, we like to see this. And we think this may be due to something known as social orienting. And that's people's natural tendency to orient their visual attention to social aspects of an environment. So people may be more quick to look at pedestrians versus other cars. Their visual attention may go there more quickly. Now when we look at our groups, we see something a little bit more interesting. So if we look at our ADHD group and our typically developing group, our control group, we see that they reacted more quickly to our social hazards or more vulnerable hazards like pedestrians and cyclists more quickly than our non-social hazards. However, we do not see this difference in our autism group. And we believe that that may be due to the fact that they have impairments in this social orienting and may not be allocating their attention as quickly to these types of hazards. So this is something we would like to see change. We want to see people reacting more quickly and responding more quickly to the more vulnerable road users, people like pedestrians and cyclists. So what does this mean for the future? Well, we hope that ours is the first autism and driving study of many studies, as only about 24% of individuals with autism are driving, and that's compared to about 90% of the general population. So there's a pretty big gap, and we know that driving is essential for many things, things like employment, just getting out of the house and being able to live separate from your parents, sorry parents, and also just enjoying social activities with friends. So we want to try to figure out what kind of challenges this population may be facing and how we can address those challenges to make sure that this population has the most successful, they have all the tools they need to be successful. They have all the tools they need to get a job and be independent members of society. So that's our goal. That's our goal for the future is to try to increase that number. And what if instead of looking at this population and saying, oh, they're probably not going to be independent. They're going to have some, they're going to have some difficulties. What if we look at those difficulties and craft training programs and try to figure out ways to help them overcome those challenges 